I don't know if you were here last week or not, but if you weren't, it might be good to, you're, you're dismissed now. There's a room back there. You can go listen to the message first. No, I'm kidding. It was called, what is it called? The pure heart? Yeah. It's like I've never spoken about the heart before, but I, I really enjoyed that. It was quite a coincidence. You know, remember last week I was speaking and um, I was talking about 1991 when I was here. Kim Clement prophesied to me and I was studying by Pastor Bob Nichols. How many remember that? Well, I'm having lunch with Pastor Richard Nash on Tuesday and he said, I want to tell you, Bob Nichols was just in town and told, told me to tell you howdy. So I said, it's pretty incredible. I just mentioned him Sunday and I haven't talked about him in years. So I just want to let you know, God still works, right? And um, that was pretty cool. And we bless Pastor Nash and True Life. I love those guys so much. Good people. Amen? Amen. Well, we talked about the heart and I kind of got this morning in that same vein. And one of the things that really blessed me this week is I found a journal that I'd made from 1973, began September the 24th, 1973. I went on a 30 day fast to Oklahoma. My friend Richard and I drove to Bowlegs, Bowlegs, Oklahoma. How many have ever been there? How many would like to go there, right? And so we found that, um, this place to put our tent, our little camper. We put our camper in the forest and a few hundred yards away was his grandparents' house. And so that made it a little bit nicer, but it was not real nice out there in the tent with the insects and the humidity. But we, we embarked on a 30 day fast. And um, after the first week, we made our way to the Maybe Sitter in Oral Roberts University and that's where we got to see Catherine Coleman. We sat on the platform right there by Richard and Oral Roberts and, and uh, all these nuns. It was a lot of fun um, and saw a lot of glory at the Catherine Coleman. There's 12,500 people inside and there was thousands of people outside. You couldn't get in. Uh, we, we lucked out. We were ordained ministers, so we were able to sit on the platform or more than likely we wouldn't have got a seat. And it was during that time that I, I, I journaled a little bit what was going on. And one of the, I wrote down several goals on what I wanted to see happen during this 30 days of fasting. Well, one of the side effects of it is I did lose 26 pounds, so, but I soon gained it back, right? But one of the, one of the things I wrote down was that I just really wanted to crucify my flesh and die to my self-will. I wanted to become a student of the Bible. I wanted to know the voice of the Lord. I wanted to become a true disciple of the Lord. I wanted to establish a positive prayer life. I wanted to crucify any critical spirit within me. I wanted to receive mantle from the Lord for the ministry that he has for me. I want to be able to say I'm confident that God is able. I want to be able to say I might know him in the power of his resurrection. I want to say that I might become unselfish in my attitude towards others. The Lord might lead me to become a more liberal giver. The Lord to make me more like Jesus. And also that I may love Sue more and that she may become more submissive. <laughs> Honest to God, I wrote that down. <laughs> Hallelujah. And... <laughs> that I myself might become under submission one to another in the fear of the Lord. And actually it was just what I wrote, that I might love her as Christ loved the church that she might submit unto me. 
I'm sorry, that's scriptures. What scriptures, right? Okay. That our children will grow up in the ways of the Lord. Well, how, how does that work? Yeah. Okay. I think pretty good, right? That the ministry the Lord has given me, my, and by the way, Jennifer, you were only uh, six, five months old when I wrote this down. That we might learn to share in the heartaches and the joys alike. that we may have an abundance in everything to give more. And I prayed for my, had to pray for my family and so forth. So I started this journey and um, on this 30 day fast, we, we didn't actually stay there 30 days. It was closer to 20 um, before we left. We had about all of Oklahoma we could stand after 20 days, but it was pretty interesting because each morning I would wake up and, and I would write what happened the day before. And it was pretty neat to see the unfolding of this journey and the process that God took us through. And it, what's amazing about this fast was that this fast was taken um, less than a, just a few months after the encounter that we had with the Lord in Louisiana when the angels sang to us and that we moved into the supernatural realm in a very phenomenal way. And then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, June of 1973, uh, there was just uh, incredible presence of the Lord, move of God. And on the heels of all of that presence and all that glory, uh, we went on a fast. Because we knew in our hearts at the time that we needed more than just the manifestation of His presence. There needed to be something dramatically transform in our hearts and in our lives. We even at that young age, we recognized the, the deception that can so easily creep in to the heart of man that can lead us off into destruction. And being around now almost 48 years in ministry, one of the saddest things about the ministry. There's not much sad about it, but the one thing you could say is sad is to see the, the wake of destruction, the many, many, many that have fell by the wayside over the years, especially those that have, that have great callings upon their life. That, that's been one of the, the, the tragedies. Yet there's far more joy than the tragedy, right? There's far more victories than what we've seen defeat, but yet those that have suffered the defeat, to, to nonetheless to them it is a defeat. And it's, it's something that we, we have to understand that, that everything begins with a platform in your life. And the way you position yourself determines the outcome of what you become. And you can't escape that. If, if you position yourself wrong in your heart, that's eventually going to catch up with you. It's eventually going to cause you to come to ruin or destruction or to unfruitfulness in your life. But if you position yourself right, you've consequently set this platform or the stage for the blessing of the Lord to continue in your life. Amen? And I'm thankful for these days because in the process of all this glory, and believe me, there was more glory than you can even imagine. But in the midst of this, there was this thing that in our heart that we wanted to humble ourselves even greater. We wanted to cry out even more that the Lord would, would crucify this old flesh and this man, old man, and the desires that we had would, would be put to death. Because there was a knowledge in our hearts even then that, that unless we had that, there was no chance of our long-term survival in the ministry. And that keeps being reinforced over and over in my spirit. And that's why even today, after all of these years, after all of these victories, after all these trials, after all the things that we all go through individually, I keep referring back to the single most important aspect of my walk with God is that, that I keep my heart in all diligence, that I constantly allow the Lord to circumcise the heart and to reveal the areas of my life that, that are seeds of destruction that may cause me to fail. 
Because one of the things that I realize is that the testimony that I have, or you have, and I'm referring to myself a lot because if you didn't realize it, most of these messages I preach are I'm preaching to myself, not to you. Because I would never want to preach down at you or preach something that, on you that would create condemnation in you. But when I preach, I'm usually preaching to this man standing in front of you because I'm probably the one that needs it the most. And so I understand that, that the one thing that I must do is, is, to, is to continually submit myself to this examination by the Holy Spirit so that my heart can become this flexible, flexible part of me that is able to contain and receive and expand upon the abundance that God wants to give in this hour. See, the heart is a very flexible organ, even in many ways more so than the stomach. <laughs> Some would argue with that. But the heart is very flexible. You, you, you see how much work it actually accomplishes on a daily basis just to keep you alive, right? And how many, the older you get, the more you appreciate it <laughs> because it, this is what keeps you ticking. It's your ticker. It keeps on ticking. And just even when it takes a licking, it keeps on ticking. It keeps on working on our behalf. And, and that's the thing, the heart of God keeps working for you, it keeps ministering to you to create through you what you're going, the outcome of what you're going to become and what you're going to re reveal upon the earth. And uh, see, if you have a heart to hear, and you know, one of the things about how do you, how do you get something into your heart? It's either by hearing, right? Or by seeing. That's why the Lord kept emphasizing, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit of the Lord says to the church. So the, the, the heart that, the, the man that hears, the man that opens himself to the voice of God, then positions himself to hear what God is speaking into his heart. Because you understand, we have no potential of change unless we're changed in the inward man. You know, Paul prayed in Ephesians that I pray that your inward man be strengthened, that you may be here in the inward man so that now you may be able to comprehend the love of God, the height and the breadth and the depth and the length, that you may be able to understand this nature that God wants to put in you. So the heart that hears uh, is the heart that walks in abundance. And look what Jesus, how many times he had to deal with the hearts of his disciples. Even after the resurrection, he said to the two who were on the road to Emmaus, oh, slow of heart, how slow are we to hide the word in our heart? You see, the word is the anchor of our heart. It's the, the anchor, but it's also the food of our heart. It's what we've got to eat, the word of the Lord. Jesus Quoted it, he said that, that man will live not by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So we consume the word. Everybody say, I'm a consumer of the word. Amen. Our, the Bible talks about buying the truth and selling it not. So there's something in us that craves the word of the Lord. Something in the nature that God put in us that says, we must have your word, O Lord. We'll perish without it. If you perish without it, what will you do with it? Amen. The word becomes a lamp under your feet. It becomes the illumination to your whole being, the word of the Lord. The prosperity that we seek is not something that we derive from ourselves. The righteousness that we cry out for is not something that we can bring forth from our own being, but all of that comes by what God has said to us. That's what Jesus said when he combated the devil in the wilderness. He said, he said uh, I'm standing on what God has said. The devil kept trying to say, this is what I'm saying to you for you to be, but the Lord kept saying, no, this is what God says that I am. So we, we settle that in our hearts. We say, we believe who you, 
what you have declared us to be. Not what anyone else tells us. I mean, guess what? You're going to have a lot of people in your life encourage you, but you're going to have just about as many in order to balance the scales that are going to try to discourage you. So what are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the word of man? You see, I don't want to believe the word of man, whether it's a positive word or a negative word. I want to believe the word of God. Now, thank God you speak positive things to me, but I'm not going to receive it if it's not the word of the Lord. Amen. But if it's the word of the Lord, I'm going to chomp down and eat it. Hallelujah. Because that word will transform me. You know, Ezekiel was a prophet of the heart. And God said to Ezekiel, I will take out the stony heart out of your flesh and I will put a right heart within you. Amen. King David saw the necessity himself. He said, Lord, create in me a clean heart. God, renew a right spirit within me. How many have ever gotten off and you've got a wrong spirit? Wow. It, it's hard for me to admit that sometimes because I want to be right. How many, how many want to be right about most things? And one of the things that people criticize me the most about, and they're probably very right on in their criticism, is that you just always want to be right. Well, who doesn't, right? <laughs> we all want to be right, but sometimes we're wrong. And we have to be willing to acknowledge that. When there's something that's wrong in our spirit, we have to be willing to hone up to that fact and say, yes, Lord, there's something wrong within me. Create, Lord, in me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Take out the defilement out of my spirit. The Bible said the heart of man is deceitfully wicked above every member. So when you trust your heart on a natural level, you're trusting in the wrong thing. You say, well, I just feel this way. Well, I just, uh, this just feels right to me. Well, it might not be right. Have you ever thought about that? Yeah. <laughs> Your feeling may not be the right feeling. Your thoughts may not be the right thoughts. Your judgments may not be the right judgments. But th the stubbornness of man is to not is to always assume that what we think, what we believe, and how we feel is how everything is. But that's not reality. The reality is what does the Lord say? See, you cannot live in the land of subjection and fulfill the will of God. You must somehow transition from a subjective spirit to an objective viewpoint and let the Lord determine the course of your life. You say, well, I want to be subjective because I want to have this touchy-feely thing going on. No, you don't. Yeah, be touchy-feely, but with an objective spirit. <laughs> right? How many of you ever got tripped up when someone was going through something and they were just becoming a moaner and a complainer, and you just emphasize with them? And pretty soon you become the same moaner and complainer as they are. When you ought to be telling them, the word of the Lord says this about the thing that you're evaluating. Because your evaluation is based on the subjectiveness of how it's affecting you, not what God is saying. Good stuff? Everybody say, good stuff. We like this kind of stuff, don't we? We really do. See, the Lord wants to be continually involved with you with the heart decision. Every time I step out and make my decision, I usually have to retreat and say, God, show me your way. For his ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. The heart becomes open to hearing the word of the Lord. Because the reason why it's so important to hear is because it's not so much the hearing as much as what comes out. Because 
What comes out only has validity when you voice it or you act upon it. How many have ever been mad? How many have ever let your madness overflow with someone else? And then the minute that it overflowed and you spilled all over them, you regretted it. Because you sent out a sword, a wound that all of a sudden you created and now you, you feel consciousness about it and now you gotta go back and try to correct it. How many know that sometimes it doesn't work? Some people don't want the correction. Of, of your repentance because you've opened up a wound in them that now they want to fire some missiles back at you. <laughs> Years ago, I called up a, a spiritual friend of mine who was, I looked up to as a mentor and so forth. And I was really concerned about him, some of the things he was saying. And I, I called him and say, hey brother, uh, I just need to talk to you. And so I started telling him what I was concerned about. And I thought, well, boy, he would just fall on the floor and humble himself and say, oh, please pray for me, my brother. I know I've offended you. I've offended others. No, that wasn't the response I got. <laughs> it sounded good for a while. About 30 minutes later, he calls me back. So now he wants to tell me everything about me that's not right. And so I had to sit there and take it because I just told him what wasn't right about him. Now he was going to tell me what was not right about me. It got to the point that we finally broke both down laughing because we realized what we were doing. Tit for tat. By God, if they're going to tell me my problems, I'm going to tell them theirs. How many of you husbands and wives have ever been guilty of that? <laughs> Honey, you didn't put up your toothpaste. So the, the guy's thinking, hmm. 30 minutes later, he said, um, I didn't like the way that you washed the dishes last night. Well, I don't like the way that you look in the mornings. Well, I don't like the way you snore. And pretty soon the thing, I'm just using some mild examples. I know it's a lot worse in reality. Pretty soon this thing escalates until there's no room for anything but judgment and criticism. But see, that doesn't happen when you let your mouth speak out of your heart. And when you don't voice something, guess what? You don't create something. The words you speak are creative. So the prophetic is so important in the kingdom because when we prophesy, we literally create something that, that can happen. We set the stage for God to move if we come into unity with God in God's will and declare it. We set the stage for the breakthrough to come. We set the stage for the gifts to be released, the ministers to come forth. We set the stage for the will of God to be done when we proclaim out of the heart that's believed. See, it's out of the heart comes forth the abundance of God. But when we speak out of the mind, out of offense or subjective spirit, then we create destruction. God did not... God did not give you a mouth to destroy others. Now you can destroy and pluck down and destroy the works of the devil with the things that you speak, but God didn't tell you to destroy each other. Amen? The, the Bible talks about that, biting and devouring one another. You peck me, I'm gonna peck you back. And bless God, you're gonna get pecked harder than you peck me. Well, pretty soon they're gonna peck back harder than you realize they could peck. And now it's all called the pecking order. <laughs> right? Hallelujah. Let the word of Christ, it says in Colossians, dwell within you richly that you can speak to another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You've been, when you soak up the word and you become a, a listener of what God is saying and you say, Lord, I hide that word in my heart. 
It's, that's the characteristic of Mary. Remember Mary in the Bible, the mother of Jesus? She said, Lord, I've hid your word in my heart. She said, let it be done unto me according to what you've spoken. And believe me, there's, my life has been filled full of God speaking to me. And yours has too. And not always did that word that God spoke to me lead me down the path that I would have chosen. Because the path that I would have chosen would have been filled with riches and fame and accolades. <laughs> the path that I would have chosen would be filled with palm leaves like I'm going into Jerusalem. The path that I would have chosen would have been, Hosanna, Hosanna, you're the king. That's the path that I would have chosen. But the path that God chose for me was that path, but it led through a different journey. And I look in the, now look in the Bible, Colossians chapter, I mean, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Open your Bible there, please. And uh, I could read the whole thing, but I won't. I'm just going to kind of skip through this. But Paul is pleading with the Corinthian church, uh, and he goes on to say in verse 3, we give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. Verse 4, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, and distresses. How many, would, how many would want to go into the ministry if you thought the ministry was going to lead you in tribulations, needs, distresses, stri in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, and in fasting? How many think that would be the poster that would entice you to surrender to the ministry? See, we do people a disservice in this hour when we teach our young disciples that the ministry is some glorious event that's going to take place in their life. It is glorious. There's nothing that compares. There's nothing that compares to selling your heart out to the King of glory and yielding yourself to Jesus Christ. There's nothing that compares to that. But the reality is, in order for you to become like Christ, you're going to follow the path of Christ that Paul did. And I would venture to say, what's creating the ineffectiveness in us? Why are we ineffective so much in our in our presentation, in our testimonies, because we've not yet identified with this pathway that Paul's speaking about. By purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth the power of God, the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and by good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Someone says, well, man, don't tell me about the cross again because I don't want to think about the sorrow and the pain but let me tell you what, the sorrow and the pain of the cross has no comparison to the joy that's revealed through it. That's why Jesus said, I'm able to endure this cross because of the joy that's set before me. You say, well, I don't want to go through a cross. You don't want the glory. You don't want the joy. And the thing that, about it, there's so much glory in God that when you go through any of these testings, if you do go through them, pray you don't, but when you go through these testings, they become irrelevant. They become insignificant in the comparison to the light of the glory of God. Amen? Because see, what God is doing through all of this is he's creating 
an image imprinted upon your heart of who he is. So there can be a reflection of that nature come through you that purely represents his motivation, his sincerity, and his commitment to humanity. It all comes through, the, through what God has imprinted upon you. As unknown and yet well-known, as dying, behold, we live. As chastened and yet not killed. As sorrowful yet rejoicing. As poor yet making many rich. Isn't it amazing how Jesus became poor that we may be rich? Paul poured himself out as an offering that we may be enhanced and empowered. So what do I take all this stuff that God gives me? I come just like he did and I give it back. See, the riches that God gives you are never intended to enrich you, but it's to become that you may become the riches of God through others. Amen? The greatest test I went through in my life, and I told you last week there for like 15 years, it had over $60 million passed through my hands. The greatest, the greatest gift that I ever had was that testing to not let any of that stick to me, but to only let me be a pass-through of riches. God didn't bring the riches for me to be rich. He brought the riches for me to enrich humanity with it. Amen? Nothing wrong with getting rich. I hope you all get rich. But I hope, it, I hope it doesn't destroy you like I've seen it destroy so many. There's something about riches of the world that create the puffy, puffiness in our head that thinks that we created that. But all that creation comes from the Lord. I'm not the author of any of that glory. I'm not the author of any of that wealth. That wealth cometh from heaven. And just as quick as it comes, it can go, believe me. But it means a hill of beans because it means nothing to us. We're simply stewards of the grace of God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, help me represent truth this morning. It's, it's a struggle trying to speak or believing to speak pureness because pureness is so rejected. Human nature res, res, despises the purity of God because it holds us to a standard that we, none of us want to live up to. The righteousness of God in light of our unrighteousness is a difficult thing to choose because there's something in us that resists that righteousness. We resist the purity of, of the spirit we, we want to keep, and I, I'm speaking to myself, I want to keep inserting myself into the equation so that it'll work out for me. And the only thing that'll work out with me is, this is what I'm fixing to read you right here. Okay, you ready? Oh, Corinthians. Now, let me say it this way. Oh, Austinites. We've spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. That's my cry as a minister of the gospel. I don't want to come and represent a philosophy, a doctrine, or a, a, a methodology, or a tradition, or a religion. I want to come to you and say, my heart is wide open to you. I am standing before you, and this is my prayer, as a man without walls, without selfish ambition or selfish desire or something that would seek anything of what I would want in the equation of the whole thing that we're doing. All I can say is, Lord, I want to stand as a, uh, as a vessel that has an open heart so that anything that does come out of me comes because of the word that I've eaten, the heart that I've pursued, the will that I've submitted to, the, the desire of the kingdom that I crave for. Let that be the expression out of who I am. Oh, Austin, my heart is open to you, is what Paul said. Wow. He said this, you are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Wow. 
How many people have accused, whether it be the minister or the husband or the wife or the boss or the employee, how many have said, if it wasn't for them, if it wasn't for someone's reaction or someone's voice that they spoke or someone, the way they treated me or the way they acted to me, if it wasn't for them, I would have been free. I, I've had people, you know, and I know I've got a lot of problems, believe me. I got more problems than you've, you've even counted up yet. I, could, I can add to the list if you want to take some time. I can tell you more. But the reality is I'm not your problem. Or so-and-so over there at that church over there, that church, they're not your problem. Oh, if only he had recognized me, I wouldn't be so restricted. No, but I agree there's a lot of men of God, including myself, that make a lot of mistakes, and God help me, and I repent for any restriction I've ever placed upon you. But as you can see, if you just observe... The people that buy into this aren't restricted here. They're pretty free. Would you agree? Would you say you're pretty free? Yeah. yeah. Did you know, do you know there's more freedom coming? Because as long, when we start taking down the walls of our own affection, the restrictions become less to us. One thing that I've learned is to have the fear of God. And if I were to restrict you because of my own personal opinion about you, I would be fearful of my future. But if you have the wrong affection and the wrong desires, you're going to feel like you've run into a brick wall that can't be moved. Because, but I'm not, it's not someone else's the wall. The wall's in you. You're just bouncing off yourself. And if that's stirring you up a little bit, it's probably because it needs to. If you don't want to come to church and be stirred up a little bit about, effects, about how you respond to your own affections and desires, then you're in the wrong place. You don't want a church. You want a social club. A church is when Jesus Christ is preached and you, you become like Paul said, all I care about is Jesus Christ and him crucified. The power of God is the power of the crucifixion to my life. That's what the power is. It's when there's a confrontation to my nature and I submit to it so that he can become Lord to my life. If you don't want the Lordship of Christ, what do you want? Feel good? You want to feel good? You want to you want to you want to have church, or do you want truth? Truths will set you free. It'll re unlock the door of deception that's keeping you restricted from becoming the thing that God has called you to be. Every one of you here have a call of God upon your life that exceeds probably anything you can even imagine. but you can't see it as long as you're restricted. We need to have a resistance movement. We need to resist the old man. We need to declare war on the old nature. I refuse to be captured by this old nature any longer. I refuse to, be a, be, to resist God but I'm going to resist this nature that binds me and keeps me captive. And I'm going to pursue this heart that liberates me. Now in return for the same, I speak to you as children. You be also open. So here, we're wide open to you. Now, why don't you come and you be open too? When you open yourself up, you risk a lot. You really do. But believe me, it's a beautiful risk <laughs> because it brings liberty. Liberty. 
Everybody wants liberty, right? Wow. I messed up. I didn't get to the notes. See, you live by the things of God that are released within you. That's what releases. And see, we eat and we assimilate this word in the book of Romans chapter 10. It says that the word of God that fills our heart, we believe it and we speak it, it results in our salvation. See, so the word that comes by faith, you see, faith is like, and I wrote it down, let me find it. Yeah, faith is a fuse. And the mouth is the fire. So when you have faith in your heart and you believe God, it says all things are possible to them who believe. And it says that out of your mouth shall begin to flow this word. And this word is a release of the power of God upon the earth. So I'm not going to let my own personal baggage restrict me from becoming this release of this word upon the earth. Because if I'm all the time thinking about all this stuff, then how am I going to be this prophetic voice that speaks? God put me in my heart an unwavering faith, a faith that cannot be moved. Lord, put within me a singleness of purpose and mind that nothing wavers in my heart. For it says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways that he will think he receives something from the Lord, but he will not because he's double-minded. Let my mind be singular focused upon the will and the purpose and the plan of God upon this earth. I know that the things of this earth to some of you seem so important, but they're really not. The most important thing you have is not your job. It's not your your occupation or your ambition or even your ministry. The most important thing upon the earth is the word of God upon the earth. That's your purpose. That's your plan is to become an oracle of the living God to declare his kingdom come, his will be done upon earth as it is in heaven. That becomes the heart's cry. Gee, just one sentence from God One sentence from the Lord can turn loose the situations in every area of your life that brings resolve and purpose and plan. Well, I'm studying to be this. I'm studying to be that. Well, good. Study that. But that's not what you're becoming. Oh, I'm going to become a doctor. I'm going to become an engineer. I'm going to become a a contractor. Or I'm going to become a preacher. I'm going to become this or that. Well, good. Become that. But that's not really who you are. You're something greater than that. See, if, you, if you're pursuing something of the world and all of a sudden your pursuit comes up short, you're going to live your life in disappointment. That's right. Or you could live your life in an overinflation of who you think you are. But if you're pursuing God, there's no disappointment in him. You'll find no one disappointed that finds him. Yeah. That's right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you might not wind up as much as what the world would, would say, look at who this person is, but you wind up as a mighty woman or man of God. My little grandmother, I told you the story, she never owned a phone, she never owned a, a, a car, she never had a bank account, but yet she was mighty in the kingdom of God because her focus was on the kingdom of God and the, proclaiming the word of the Lord and she created me out of the openness of her heart It created me and who I became. I wouldn't trade her for any doctor, any lawyer, any rich investor. I know people that have a hundred million dollars. I know people that have a billion dollars, but I wouldn't trade that grandmother for any of them. Because in the sight of man, she was nothing, but in the sight of God, she was mighty. Amen. That's who you are this morning. I I applaud you for your accomplishments in life, but in the sight of God, that's not what I really commend you for. I commend you for your faithfulness to the Lord and your willingness to open your heart to receive this incorruptible, undefiled word that creates in you this fire in your bones. Like the prophet said, it's shut up in me and I cannot stop it. It's what I've become. It's who I am. It's what defines me. 
It's this thing you put in my spirit. That's what I am. That's who I am. That's what I become. Is this thing that you've spoken. Hallelujah. Wow. Woo, your faith is a fuse and your mouth is a fire. Light the fuse. Explode the word of God into action in your life. See, the word in your, in your heart, you can speak it to minister a blessing. You can speak it to receive a blessing. You can do anything that you feel. You can do according to the scriptures, anything that enters the imagination of your heart. Isn't it amazing how God just takes the limits off when you begin to come into his plan? Anything you can imagine. I have not seen or heard or entered the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. Anything you can imagine. If you'll stand in the purity of opening your heart to God and exposing that heart to others, the Lord will allow to come through you something that's so incredible that you can't even imagine what it is. Hallelujah. We're only at the very cusp. We're only at the very beginning. We're only at the genesis of this thing being birthed upon the earth. It's greater than we can imagine. It's more than we can believe for. It's that awesome. It's that awesome that there's no limitation on what it can become and what it can do. So go out this morning and just say, Lord, man, I'm opening up. Pour, pour it into me, Lord. Even if it creates some problems initially, which it might, because it's going to start crossing your wheel. But that's okay. Just fall on the sword, fall on the rock. Don't wait for it to fall on you. Fall on the rock because realizing that out of that is going to come some incredible fruit out of your mouth, out of your life, out of the destiny of who we are. Wow. See, we'll never be defeated. We'll never be dismayed. We'll never retreat because we have opened ourselves up to him. If I had to do this in my own power, how about you? We'd fail, wouldn't we? It's not by power, nor by might, but by the Spirit, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. If it was up to us, we would fail miserably because we don't have the strength to accomplish the will of God. But when we come before the Lord and open ourselves to him, that supernatural power comes in us that sustains us, enables us, empowers us, fills us. So well, how do you do it for this many years? Well, I can't do it. <laughs> I couldn't do this. How could I be up here at 70 years old, stronger than I've ever been in the Lord? How could I do that? Stronger in the flesh. Why? Because there's something of him that propels that energy in my spirit. It's the dunamis of God that comes in a man's heart when he knows him and the power of his resurrection. Not bragging on myself because I know how tentative that is. It's very tentative. It all depends on what I do with it tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Like that journal I wrote, today I'm waking up Today I'm weak in my flesh. Today I'm tired. Today I'm discouraged. Today I'm lonely. But today I'm encouraged in the Lord. Hallelujah. Today I wake up and I've been in prison. Paul said, I've been scourged. I've been persecuted. I've been in tribulation. But I'm rejoicing in the Lord my God. For the Lord my God is with me. And I'm strong in the Lord and I'm in the power of his might. Well, I'm just going through it. Well, that's good. We all go through it. Get through it and go on. Hallelujah. Go on from glory to glory and from image to image. Transformed by the power of the living God. I'm praying and releasing you today. I'm releasing you today in the name of Jesus to become an open heart, an open book to the Lord. A people yielded and submissive to the will of God above everything else. Crying out. That, Lord, let this work be performed in me that you've called me to be. 
Mary said, Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. Yes, I'm going to be persecuted because of this. They'll speak evil of me. They'll tell that I'm a loose woman. They're going to say all this bad stuff, but Lord, I know that what you're birthing in me is the glory that's going to bring forth the victory to the earth in Jesus' name. That's what God has destined and ordained you, to be a partaker of this divine nature, this glory that's gonna sweep the earth. Whew, how can you believe that? I believe it, don't you? I believe it. Stand up with me this morning. Today is Rosh Hashanah. It's a day of declaration. Come on up, get Todd again, and we're gonna blow, blow some more trumpet. Woo, put your hand on your heart. Lord, let my heart be open to you. Be it done unto me, Lord, according to thy word. Create in me a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within me, Lord. Let my heart be open to the will of God. Lord, I do not want to become part of the resistance. I want to become part of the open book. I want to open myself up. I want to give myself fully to your purpose and your plan and your will upon the earth. I refuse, Father, to fall back into the traps of subjectiveness and, and fear and disillusionment. But Lord, I stand in faith and boldness and confidence knowing that what you've begun working in me will be completed in me and I will not be ashamed, but I will stand and proclaim the will of God to the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Father.